your soul. Yo, half the story has never been told. Ladies, you got to demand what you want and what you want is respect, right? Yo, just sit up on the track, I don't so have to feel it, it rhymes. Freedom every time for the sisters. Check this. Watch this. And here we go now. Listen, if I'm boom boom rule, I be the ruler like uh, slick brick. Uh, uh-huh. Hit with this quick witted the key to swearing shit. Yeah. Papa got a brand new bag. Mama got a brand new jag. A go tag. I ain't no old yeah, hag. Nah, I represent not only in the kitchen, in the bedroom, but also in the boardroom. So give me more room. Deny my opportunity. You in jeopardy. Yo, yo, set me free. Don't hinder me. Let me be. I'm fighting for freedom. I got the heat in case you need them. Uh, straight soldier. Ain't nobody told ya. Hold up. Hello everybody, welcome to the Book Slam Extra. I am your host Jules. I hope you are doing very well on this fine Sunday day. Um, I have had an interesting week. It's been the last week of term for lots of students, so it's been a bit manic for them. Uh, so that's been fun. Um, but I have also been writing madly as well, which has also been fun too. Um, I am going to um, welcome my co-host to the screen. Because I'm having a very bad day today. Hello! <laughs> oh, my God. How goes it? Pardon? How goes it? How are you? Oh, it goes well. It goes very well. Um, yeah, and my computer decided it was going to have a moment and wouldn't allow me onto Google or anything. <laughs> well, I'm, so I'm, I had glad to, like, I'm glad we're all here today. Yes, I had to do a hard reset. Um, but we have got a cool show today because we're looking at not necessarily actual writing, but we're looking at something different today, aren't we? Um, mm-hmm. Which is the synopsis, which everyone hates. Do you, what's your thoughts on synopses? Uh, I always find it easier to write a synopsis for somebody else's book than my own book. I think being so close to the work is way more difficult than having somebody tell you what, your, what their story is about and then you summarize it down. Condensing somebody else's work, I think, is easier. Yeah, it's really hard. Like when I sat down and tried to write the synopsis for mine, I I was I just didn't know what in what bits to include. What was the important salient points that were actually going to be worthwhile? You know, they're going to you know bang 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 kind of you know get the person going. Oh, that's really exciting. Um, so why yeah, so it was. Why don't you properly introduce yourself and give us a little synopsis <laughs> of your book? <laughs> that's <laughs> true. Fun. Yeah. Yeah, well, I got I got a little bit distracted by the internet, kind of put me off a little bit. Uh, I, I I am obviously <laughs> I'm obviously Jules, as it says on the screen. Um, I am a dark fantasy author. I have written four books, two separate series, one for children, one for adults. Um, the children's one's not so dark fantasy; it's more dealing with sort of mental health and mental well being and you know, worry monsters and fun things like that. My dark fantasy series for their adults is uh, about trauma more than anything else and how you recover from trauma. Um, I am also in the process of writing, hang on, what? Two anthology short stories, one collaboration with you, my lovely co-host, and um, also book three of both those series. So that's that's quite a bit. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, <laughs> basically what I'm doing at the moment. <laughs> what about you? <clears throat> well, do you want to, do you want to try, and, try and give us a synopsis of, of your, just one of the books, maybe oh. maybe your uh, your Ray book? Ooh. <clears throat> Ooh, do you want me to just verbalize it as in like without yeah, reading? Yeah, just spit yeah. it out. <laughs> spit it out, okay. All right. Um, uh, all right. This is book two of my um dark fantasy series um of shadow and swords so um god this is so difficult oh my gosh um ray this is why we're talking about it today (laughs) dramatic pause um okay so um teenager ray um has been trapped in the mountains she has escaped the dungeon but now feels trapped in the space that she's in even though it's in the open air She's got a new family who have welcomed her with open arms, but she's angry and she's upset because she had to leave her sister behind. So her driving fear is to try and go back and rescue her sister because she feels guilty. The problem that she has is she's also got tons of refugees pouring into the mountains who have had to escape from their villages being literally razed to the ground by the enemy. 
the villagers um, in the mountains don't like the refugees and have been ordered to not serve them and not do anything with them. So the refugees are stuck in the shadows of the mountains, hidden away in the forest somewhere. Ray seeks help. The uh, seer of the town, um, he uh, cuts a deal with her uh, because he's going to kill all the refugees because he hates them. He's racist. And um, so he cuts a deal with her. If, if she can find the person who's betrayed their tribe to the enemy, then he will save all of her refugees. So Ray then sets about trying to work out who it is and thinks she finds them. She ends up uh, coming across uh, the commanders um, who Raven basically forbids her to join because of stuff that they did to his father and he bitterly hates them, but they are her only way that she can actually do what she needs to do and achieve the, the goal of saving her people. She's now torn between two nations. What does she do? Um, the commanders see her archery skills. Are there more? Yeah, wait. So this yeah. is why, I feel like this is why synopsis get confusing because we what, we start pouring so much detail into the into the description of the story, and yeah, we I think overdo it. Was there, was yeah. there, is there a ton more that you would want to explain? Only, your... only, a, tu only a touch more. So she oh, gets put on a right, mission. Right. Yeah, she gets put on a mission by the commanders and it goes horribly wrong. And um, through it, she then ends up making some very bad choices. Um, that feeds her anger even more, which then leads to her creating an army that takes it back to the castle to go and rescue her sister. And that's where I'm going to leave it. <laughs> okay, wow. Okay. So that, that would be, yeah. So it kind of, yeah. And as you said, there's so much stuff in it. It's like, what bits do you yep. choose and which bits do you select not? <laughs> what about you? How would you do one of yours? Uh, so, so I'm Adam Andrews Johnson. I also write dark fantasy, but more of the grim dark stuff. Here's my my book, uh, The Mantis Variant. Uh, I have three in the series released. Um, so What's it about? I just noticed your hair. I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt you. I have literally just noticed your hair. I'm so sorry. I'm going to done yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I can see the front. Of it. Yeah, no, subtle, it's really you know, subtle. Real subtle. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, carry on. <laughs> right. Um, yes. So uh, in the future, humans have started developing superpowers. However, mm -hmm. unlike in comic books, you can easily murder one of these superheroes if you catch them unaware and kill them and smash open their head and cannibalize them by eating their brains and you can steal their powers from them. So it's kind of twisted, messed up. And so the story follows three people, one who was forced through a cult ritual ceremony to become one of these cannibal people and she has escaped and she's awesome. She's sort of the main focus of the story. And then her two, I don't want to call them sidekicks, but the two other people that are working through the story are a human and then one of these advanced people who has a superpower and she's living in secret. Three of them come together, they work together, there's devastation, there's a battle um, underground, there's, yeah, it's just all sorts of stuff, lots of death, and yeah, I try, I try, I try not to add too much detail because yeah, I feel like it's so easy to just start <laughs> running down the story itself. Yeah, it is. It's really difficult to write a really succinct, short synopsis, and one of the problems that lots of authors come across is where to start, what bits are interesting, what bits are important, and what's going to grip the interest of the person reading it. And, and so, yeah. It's short and simple. Short and simple. That's yeah. the, that's the major simple. part of it, too. Yeah. I think also that goes along hand in hand with the synopsis is also the, the letter that you have to write to agents or to um, uh, publishing companies where you have to kind of introduce yourself and introduce the story. A lot of it feels like you're just kind of regurgitating stuff all the time. Um, and it's quite interesting. The expectations and the requirements of every single publishing house is different. So if you are approaching publishing houses, um, this is to anyone, I would highly recommend make sure you do your research on both publishing houses and agents um, and look at what their entry requirements are, because if you don't meet it, it will literally just not even get looked at. It will just go from one part to the next, which will be the bin. And obviously that's quite soul destroying for an author and harsh. Um, but 
the big ones particularly, they have thousands of people sending their books in every day. So they don't have time uh, to, to read stuff that is a bit, you know, not interesting. Um, so, yeah, so the synopsis is a really essential part of the application process to try and get published. Um, I also do publishing. And one of the things I look for is I like the meat of the story, um, but I also like the originality. So if an author submits their work to me, um, I like their personality to be part of that because whilst, yes, it's publishing their work, it's also the relationship that you have with them and it you're investing in the person, not just the work. And if you've got someone who is not adept at... How do I word this? They're not adept at being able to really represent themselves in a way that makes them seem interesting or unique or something that someone can invest in. Publishers are less likely to look at that. Agents are less are very similar. They do a very similar kind of process. Um, and lots of publishing houses will only accept work submitted via agents so make sure you look out for that as well but yeah it is it's a tricky process isn't it i don't want to go into the publishing process specifically because obviously that could be a whole new show <laughs> um but with the with the synopsis how long do you spend writing your synopsis oh i feel like i'm constantly editing it i feel like i've got mm -hmm. four or five sentences that i think sort of encompass the story and every time i look at it i'm like oh wait i should change this and that yeah i feel like every time mm -hmm. i go to it there's a I should add a little sentence here or take something out. Yeah, I'm never satisfied with it. One of the things that I found is quite useful, actually, is finding someone who is um, an honest uh, friend in like or like a sort of, you know, peer relationship type of thing who can actually like be a peer author who you can actually get them to help you write it or to read your work and then give you ideas on where to go with it in terms of content. Because sometimes we're completely blinded by our own work that it's really difficult to see which parts of it are relevant and which are Absolutely. not. Absolutely, yep, yep. And having, having so, a writing buddy is, is essential. Yeah, this, this practice of, of being an author writing is so solitary. Yeah, having somebody mm -hmm. to connect with is good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and there's I think also they 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 hear and, and read things that are different in your story than what you've written. Mm -hmm. So you might perceive it to be one thing and then they have read it and they have literally read it in a completely different way. And that's not a problem. But obviously, the way then you write your synopsis needs to reflect that somehow within it. Um, you know, that it needs to have some sort of self-awareness of what you're writing it for and who you're writing it to. Mm -hmm. um, how long would you say would be a, a like a good length for a synopsis? I think only a few sentences. I think it's it's got to be quick because I think that that you need to let people know what you're doing immediately and and not spend extra time describing things and giving them a chance to get lost. Mm. It's really difficult because lots of publishing houses actually require um, a whole page of A4 or uh, 500 words um they, they normally have one that um like a requirement saying um a you know no more than 500 words um but they do expect a minimum it's really like you said it's yeah you want it to start yeah you want it really short and quick but at the same point those points need to be put across and uh yeah, that could be really tricky i think so yeah so my advice is definitely if you're looking at publishing route look at what the publisher publishes um look at um if they have particular stories that they're looking for or authors that they're working with look for how long they want the parameters that you were just talking about yeah because because you're right i tend to lean towards a short synopsis but if they're asking for two pages yeah that, then then yeah. i would i would struggle to figure out exactly what to put in that yeah it's really hard because you're kind of doing like an outline of the story uh, without any of the gump that kind of goes with it and the sort of emotional attachment there. Um, so, yeah, it can be very difficult to, to write that. Um, now, should we, should we invite our wonderful guests? I think we should, on? yes, let's, let's do that. Let's, They've been very patient. Keep, they have been extremely patient. Um, okay, hang on a second. Welcome, welcome, Yay. welcome. 
Yay! Hello. Unmuted. Hello. How are you all doing? Hello. Oh, see, your hair looks so much nicer than mine. Mine looks like I'm in a boy band gone wrong, like from the 1990s. <laughs> That's quite I'm a trying to get. Well, well welcome. Uh, JP, would you like to go first and sort of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your writing and what inspires you and whatever? Or we can get your sure. work. Yeah, so my name is JP Barnett, as you mentioned. I am the author of the Lore Stalker series, which is a six book series, five books which of are out now. And the sixth book is in the very last stages of editing with a publisher, so it'll come out later this year. Um, the series as a whole, my like one sentence elevator pitch is that it's about two college girls that hunt monsters instead of going to class. So um, <laughs> it's a it's kind of a fun adventure series. It's a little it's urban fantasy and horror a little bit, but uh, pretty pretty light horror, pretty PG thirteen horror. I usually tell people uh, I usually uh, Stranger Things like on Netflix is a good it doesn't get any scarier than that. Um, probably less scary than like the most recent season. Um, and by monsters, specifically, they're hunting cryptids. So each one's inspired Ooh. by, like, the real world legends and lore of a real, well, I guess, real cryptid. cryptid. Uh, so the first one is inspired by Bigfoot. The second one's inspired by the Kraken. The third one is the Skinwalker. The fourth one is Hogzilla, which is a giant yes. thing. I, I grew up in Texas, so <laughs> oral pigs, dangerous. Uh, so I wrote a whole book about that. Uh, book five is about the Dover Coup, which is an Irish lake monster that not many people have heard of. And then the sixth book is just um, me jumping the shark as hard as I could. I brought back as many of the creatures as I could, as many of the characters as I could. Um, it's the only one of the series that will make no sense if you haven't read the others. The others are all pretty standalone. You can kind of jump in anywhere. Um, they are published with a small indie publisher out of Wisconsin uh, called Evolve Publishing. You can find them pretty much anywhere books are sold. They're an ebook, audiobook, and uh, paperback. I'll also have them. I can show you. Yeah, awesome. Pictures. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, Yay. I'm sorry. Let me pull you really back up. A Hang on a second, and then you can uh, show okay. those lovely pictures again. That's the first one The Beast of Rose Valley, The Kraken of Cape Madre, my favorite cover, The Witch of Grace Point. Ooh. This is the Hogzilla one, The Haunt of Hog Run. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very okay, cool. There you go. And then the last one, or the most recent published one, is The Devil of Missy Lake. I don't have the paperbacks of the six book yet, so. Very cool. Well, I love the front covers. They're really nice. Thank you thank so you. much for being here. Yay. Well, thanks for having me. Cool. You're welcome. Maria, would you like to go next? Tell us a little about yourself and where we can get your books and your bird. Sure. Your bird. Yeah, this is Rowley. Uh, he's hanging out. Uh, so yeah, I'm Maria Giacomatos. I'm the author of the Infernal Symphony, which is a four-part series. First two books are out right now. Uh, we've got Midnight Waltz and Adagio for the Fallen, and you can get them on uh, pretty much anywhere books are sold. Again, you can find the ebook, the audiobooks, at least for the first one. And the paperbacks on Amazon, you could get them through my publisher's website, Blister Press. Um, you get them through my website, uh, which I think is like author Bloody Maria. Uh, but yeah, it's also kind of like a PG-13 urban fantasy horror. Uh, it's like if Supernatural was an anime with emo teenagers. Ooh, um, yeah. My elevator pitch that I tell at conventions is we all start off in the first book. With your average teenage boy, he and his friends are going through this spooky haunted house when he meets this sassy undead goth chick. She doesn't have a soul, but it's okay. They become friends and they're just hanging out when this group of ass-kicking, demon-fighting exorcists come. And they're like, we can help her get her soul back. It's been taken by this cult of evil demon summoning mages who need it for their evil schemes. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, and, my, and I'm also published with like a small press publisher... Uh, that I actually met at a convention. So nice. I kind of got my foot in the door without having to do a lot of the <laughs> hard work with letters and whatnot. I, I must admit, the the author most of the authors that I have are people who I've actually spoken to via this kind of process rather than um all, all the submissions that are coming. So I've had some that have come in that way, but it's quite a nice way of doing it because you actually get to meet the person behind the writing, which yeah. I think is, you know, there's yeah, something special like, about 
I won't go too deep into it now in case we talk about it later. And so Daniel can have a chance to introduce himself. Uh, to mm-hmm. me, it's kind of like the difference of going to like a job fair versus just mass sending yeah. out stuff on Indeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you on that one. And the and the sorry to take up your time, Daniel, but um, yeah, the indie um, publishing houses tend to be really good at that. So, um, and I think a lot of authors are actually preferring the indie ones for that reason. That it's a lot a lot more of a pro- personable approach um so yeah and I, I you know writing is a baby isn't it that you nurture and help grow rather than just you know <laughs> so you want to work with someone who wants to work with you not just make money from you so um yeah okay cool sorry <laughs> daniel should we go to you now sure i am daniel potter i am the author of soon to be 16 books um the ones uh, i'm currently working on are my full moon medic series which is about a werewolf paramedic in portland so um it starts as uh, with abby who is a uh, a paramedic in port portland and she meets uh, a fae in a fae asks her to take care of her ward and of course you never and as a paramedic you know you sort of say things just to keep your patient calm and she agrees to look over this ward and not having encountered a fae and knowing how the deals work kind of gets stuck with with it and so um she adopts a uh, secret and is trying to keep the uh, half human, half uh, fey child from being dragged back to the winter court. And things don't go according to plan. <laughs> so that's book one of the Full Moon Medic series. Um, and then in the second book, they are dealing Abby has uh, fully embraced being a werewolf and is uh, looking for more pack members. She is actually the first werewolf because werewolf, well, magic is just coming back to this world. It kind of left, it got sealed away for several hundred and was waning for thousands of years and was completely sealed away for several hundred. And um, so as the first werewolf, she has to decide how packs and uh things are supposed to actually work so while dealing with a play plague of undead dead trying to take over the city city as a billionaire tries to take everything with him to the other side and in soul shock oh oh sorry sorry <laughs> how many sorry. books do you have published so far you said 16 but how many are actually available um let's see uh so i have uh 12 under my regular name and i have a few pen names so wow wow so full moon medic is the series i'm working on now i also have freelance familiars which was is a complete six book series about the the viewing the magical world world from the eyes of the talking animals um through a guy who gets uh, turned into a cougar and is trying not to become a witch's familiar and maintain his independence although he doesn't have thumbs and gets a little hard but he is a 200 pound cougar and so eh, he, he works some some things out, out and his buddy who is a squirrel who's very good with the dynamites um has a large role to play in that <laughs> What, what uh, age level are we talking about the, for these books? They're all adult-ish. Um, you can do young adult. All my characters swear and acknowledge sex exi- exists. Freelance Familiars is um, basically... It was my, my first series that uh, I pub- published. I wrote it pretty much as a lark. I was writing a science fiction that I never actually finished. And I'm like, mm-hmm. national novel write, writing contest is... Uh, month is coming up and I'll write a stupid story and it was my first book that I published that I finished so I'm like okay I'll put it on Amazon and people liked it so 
So there, there was no like market target market. So um, yeah, we just put put it out there. There, I've tried some other things. I also have the the Dragon's Price ser series, uh, which is about oh, which is uh, Sky Pirates versus Dragons. Wow, wow. <laughs> And you mentioned Portland, so I just figured I should say that the, the four of us over here, not including Jules, who's in the UK, we're all going to be at the Ghosts of Summer Market next weekend together, Saturday yeah. and Sunday. And Saturday at noon, 1230, we have a, a an author's panel where the four of us will all be talking about specifically horror writing, because that's wow. sort of what we do. So we're really that's excited about that. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's very exciting. Well, perhaps you'd like to, like I said to the other guest authors, like to include the information in the private chat and I'll make sure it goes up on the screen for everyone to see. So if you are in the Portland area next weekend, do go and drop them a visit. Um, because, yeah, it's always good to support our authors. Um, and it's just a nice time to remind everyone who is watching, please, 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 it would be so awesome if you could like and subscribe, if you're liking what you're hearing. You're going to hear a nice discussion in a moment, and also you're going to be able to hear some live readings from our wonderful authors. Um, and we're trying to grow a writing community here that is supportive and looks after the authors and also encourages beta readers to join and alpha readers and also anyone who just happens to like books. Um, and so there you go. Um, OK, so let, let's start off our discussion. Um, what what do you think works in a good synopsis? And this is an open question to all of you. I mean, that's a real open question because there's lots of different ways, different targets of your synopsis. Are you, do you have one sentence to target someone at a con? Do you have, are, is your synopsis for the back of the book? Do you, are you trying to actually tell your somebody of the, the entire plot so they can make some sort of marketing material from from it uh, uh like i it depends on the purpose mm -hmm. of the synopsis do you find one of the three styles that you just mentioned easier the very short single line the the long described described one of trying to get a publisher or what do you think trying to make a plot summary interesting is very very difficult <laughs> <laughs> um you know um, I think it's a very good exercise to um, think of your uh, con pitch first, because that you have to boil down what's your hook. What's your hook? My hook is like, do you want to read a story about a werewolf paramedic? And then people go like, a werewolf paramedic? And then you have a conversation. Sation. Or for freelance familiars, it's like, hey, shoot, I'm I'm out of practice now. Now, uh, so this book, I usually show them the picture of the book. Book, like, yeah, I'm the, like, stru I'm the sorry. struggle. Yeah. Yeah. The I'm struggle. The struggle. Yeah. 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 That's where I was at the beginning when Adam asked me. I was like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's like Woo. all the information like, from your book is stored in your brain. Right oh my God, yeah. Guy who gets turned into a cougar and is trying to avoid becoming a witch's famili familiar. That's pretty good. Does that sound interesting? That's okay. pretty that's, good. Yeah, yeah. That's not as sharp as I try to get it, but yeah. <laughs> I will jump in and say, uh, writing the synopsis, especially for the, like the public, when I did the querying process with my series, is the worst thing ever. I don't know how anyone can like that. It is so bad because they wanted 400 words, 250 words, and they want to know the whole plot, which is really hard because you're like, well, if I tell you the whole plot, then why would you want to read it? Or if I tell you the whole plot, you're not going to understand the intricacies that make that plot interesting. And I think that's what makes it really hard is to write the synopsis in a way that you're still capturing those intricacies and the things that are going to hook readers um, while also giving away the entire plot. And it feels like so much of it felt like you're just, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it if I break it down into 250 words or 500 Especially words. Horror novel, it's like, oh, here's yeah. the hook. Or, or here's like all the mysteries. It's like. Yeah, which you if you're querying, that's what they want. They want yeah. all of that, right? Uh, they, and, uh, and then, you know. I've never queried. 
Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty brutal. It was a. It's a. It's a brutal process. Um, you hear that? Yeah. Every other author out there who's struggling with the querying process, it sucks for everybody. Everybody. Does. So bad. Don't so do bad. It. Don't do it. Yeah. Self publishing is self -publishing. <laughs> totally awesome and legitimate. And that's why we have this show. We believe in independent and self published authors. Woo! Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I'm going to have to support this just for a moment. No, okay. no, no. I, don't I knew I was going to get a reaction out of that. <laughs> I just want to pause for a second because we're also live on Clubhouse. We're, we're live on Facebook, obviously YouTube, Twitter, and Clubhouse at the moment. Clubhouse is only uh, verbal. You can't see anyone. But we oh, do have, yeah. Adam will know this person, we do have a very wonderful returning author on there who I just want to give a little shout out to. So, Jay Edwards. Oh, Jay. <laughs> wonderful. Uh, hello, Jay. <laughs> he's trying to get on on to, onto the here, but he can't get on. So he's going to be on Clubhouse. So I may have to sporadically pause every now and again if he puts his hand up to say something or if he wants to join in, <laughs> which he's very welcome to. So I just wanted to say hello and welcome. It's so lovely to hear from you and see you again. And I hope everything is okay. Um, and oh, hang on, let me invite him as speaker as well. Then he can join in too. Mm. All right, hang on a second. Hey, how are you guys doing? Hey, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yay, we're doing good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm having trouble with streaming art, so I'm just going to be a disembodied voice from the great beyond today. <laughs> that kind of fits the theme, doesn't it, with the dark yeah. fantasy <laughs> stuff going on? <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. You enjoying the conversation so far? Yeah. Oh. Oh, we lost him. Oh, oh, signals. Uh -oh. Okay, well, how about Maria? Maria, why don't you tell us about your synopsis? I know you said you, you, you got to talk to somebody and you made a connection that way, which is awesome. And face-to-face and -face is a great way to make connections. So, but what about, what about the back of your book or the single line synopsis, like, like, uh, like Daniel was saying? Yeah, so um, it was a lot of work. At least the first synopsis was really hard because I was like, how do I do this? This is like a 400-page book. Um, as far as like the writing, um, like the back of the book stuff, um, mine's like three small paragraphs. Um, and I kind of just try to adhere to like putting in like the who, what, when, where, why, or at least for how much of it's ap applicable. Um, I mean, given that it's like set in a modern setting, the like when and where, I mean, it's kind of implied, um, but you know, I try to limit it to no more than like two names because if you put like too many names and it's like, well, who, who are all these people? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. um, just keeping it basic. Who? OK, we got, you know, main character's name and maybe like, you know, the main boy and the main girl. Easy names to tell apart. Uh, you know, where are they? OK, creepy house, haunted house. All right. You know, what, what's going on? She doesn't have a soul. He finds her. They become friends. And then, you know, why is this important? Why should the reader care? End it with a hook, um, which... I generically, I think, ended both of them, yeah, with questions. Because, <laughs> yep. like, Google yep. was like, end it with a question, yeah. like a hook. So have to I think it. it's really, just uh, that hook itself is really tricky, isn't it? Because it's yeah. what is, what is going to grab someone's attention. Um, you know, so did you have a, an example that you, you've done? Yeah, what well, would you read the question off the back of your book and just tell us what it is? <laughs> I mean, I maybe. Oh, uh, it sounds tonight. stupid out of context. I know. I was going to say it's out of context. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one random line. One sentence out of nowhere. Yeah. It means nothing to us. <laughs> like the first, the, on the first book, it's like, okay, blah, 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 you know, the, the, the thingy that I told you guys, but less, but more words. Then it's like, but can he save her from the demons of her dark past? Right. No, perfect. That and then the second perfect. one was perfect. like, but can Absolutely. he protect his soul from the mysterious entity haunting his nightmares? Perfection. It's like, yep. Perfection. Wookie, but without like, I don't know. It, it, it's that. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, when I put it, then there's like, you know, the shorter synopsis for like just like the Amazon when you click it and mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know, so many words. Mm -hmm. I usually just like cut and paste like the main part of this with the question and just mm -hmm. put it there. And that's What's it. Really been, when I'm talking so in person, oh, sorry, were you saying something? No, no, no. It's okay. No, sometimes there's a bit of a delay because I'm over in the UK. So the internet's not always as, as quick. So apologies. Okay. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then like 
a lot of my stuff is in person because I do a lot of conventions locally. Um, and you kind of see who's coming up to you. Like, is it a young person? Are they going to like my goofiness? If it's an older person who does not look amused by anything I'm doing, they're like, is this book good for my daughter or something? I try to tone it down a little bit, um, which I think is great with in-person sales is you can really play to your audience, whoever's there. Uh, and same with when you're pitching to a publisher in person, you're like, okay, what kind of person are they? What are they going to think is cool? Uh, we're online, you know, selling online or writing to an agent or a publisher online. It's like, okay, I don't know who they are, what they're going to like. So let's try to just really get that meat and make it interesting, a general interesting. I think what's, what's difficult about the whole process and also really interesting, and I'll, I'll start with the interesting bit first because it's just an observation, is actually how uncomfortable we are at actually um, – trying to condense our work to other people in such a way that it makes sense, is interesting and captivating, yet doesn't give too much away. Um, and it's quite interesting watching you all kind of, you look really awkward and uncomfortable trying to share that because it's like, I, we feel like we put you on the spot a little bit. So I'm sorry about that. Um, no, 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 that's just how I look. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the other problem, right, sorry, Adam did it to me at the very beginning. It's fine. I wasn't expecting that question, although I should have done, I should have preempted that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the other thing as well is you know, that I think that we have to be the biggest cheerleaders for our own work. And I think we find that really difficult. Uh, I think obviously you get a whole range of different personalities and some, some people are more extroverted than others. And, but generally writers tend to prefer more loan time they tend to find that more restful um and so they tend to be more introverted in the way that they approach things so actually putting themselves out there and hey it's me by my book can be really difficult <laughs> um do does anyone here have any tips that they would like to share with the audience about how to kind of go about doing that to sort of sell yourself a little bit i'm bad at it I feel I do events uh, frequently, like once or twice a month, and I still feel like I'm bad at it. And uh, no matter how many times you do it, you're going to have those people who come up and you do your best and you try to target them and then they just you just feel rejected. And I think that's what makes it hard is it's a fear of rejection every time because you tell them about your books and you try to tell them the parts that are going to connect with them. And then sometimes you're just like, oh, OK, or they're or they they're. Uh, the ones I hate are the reductivists who are just like, oh, so it's supernatural. Okay. Like <laughs> that is like, no, you weren't listening. Um, so that's the hard part for me is like that constant feeling of like, it's like, it's almost like uh, speed dating in a way. At least like you're asking someone out every time and you just get rejected more often than not. And that's hard. I think that's a really valid point actually. And um, a scary one because I think rejection as a general thing, people don't like that, whether it's a job rejection or a relationship rejection or whatever. Um, and I think if anyone goes into the world of writing, one of the hardest hurdles you have to kind of jump over is that. And it's getting to accept that as part of the process and it can be soul destroying. Um, but you have to believe in yourself and believe in your work and and just be tenacious and just keep going. You can't see it, but it, my, my T-shirt says never give up. <laughs> you lift it up too high. I, I'll be flashing people. I don't want to be doing that. But yeah, it, it, you know, it means something because you that's the whole point, isn't it? Writing. Just don't give up. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Um, but yeah. Um, does anyone else have anything they wanted to share about like techniques of writing a good synopsis or ways to go about doing it? Anything that might help? Or the, or the, the question you were just talking about the um, selling yourself in public. I, yeah. I like that where that sort of was leading also. Yeah. Yeah. It's, go on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I was more on that. Um, I do events uh, pretty often as well. I've been kind of slowing down. So I'm like, I need to focus on writing. Um mm -hmm. But I do a lot of just like small markets, art markets and, you know, conventions locally. Um, and kind of like I mentioned earlier, I try to see like, OK, what kind of person are they like? Does this look like a person that would even bother to read the book? Should I spend my energy on that? Um, and then just with that as well, like trying to see like 
it's, it's a lot of trial and error. Like if I include this part, will they want it? I'm like, mm -hmm. if I told them there's like a battle scene in a hot topic, will that sell it for them? And sometimes they're like, so <laughs> give it to me. Um, or, you know, if I tell them like, Hey, you know, this is LGBTQ friendly. Will they, will they buy it? Or, you know, some people are like, no. <laughs> uh, which, <laughs> yeah. Have fun okay. So fun. that, that, that yeah. leads me to a question. What kind of displays do you three have set up for your, for your tables? Does it, does it alert people? Do you have a rainbow that lets people know from a distance that it's LGBTQ or is it all skulls and yeah. horror stuff? Or like, what, what do you each have? That I really considered like, eye -catching stuff, eye -catching stuff. there was yeah, definitely yeah. times where I'm like, I should probably push it more that it is like pretty, especially in part, once we hit the book two, it is, pretty LGBTQ because um, you guys, I mean, you guys aren't local or I don't know how local you guys are to where I am, um, but my parents tried to, uh, my parents are boomers and, you know, they tried to like promote my books. And once they got to book two, my dad is like, how do I sell this book to my coworkers who read the first book, which was fairly innocent. And now you have gay demons and we don't do that in Maple Valley. <laughs> Uh, oh, I'm like, oh they do. They do that in Maple it. Valley. They just don't know they do that in Maple Valley. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, and, 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 you know, so far, no one has really complained about it other than, like, my parents. But, you know, they're Christian. One of the things consumers. I never thought my but, Christian um, parents would ever no, my display fun. is... Uh, so I'm also an artist and like jewelry maker. So unless I'm mm. pub I'm selling with my publisher, I also have, like, jewelry and uh, art and cool. the books are in the middle. So it's like... It does attract people who might not want the books because mm -hmm. um, uh, lo and behold, selling two books doesn't make much profit. And once people have bought those two books, they're like, well, what am I going to do at your booth? Um, so I have that stuff and it, it's pretty spooky. Like I have like a spider web tablecloth mm -hmm. and stuff. So, you know, it, it attracts people who like spooky things usually. Hence yeah. the Halloween market we're doing next weekend. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's why, like, I especially just go ham during, like, October. Like, I think I think one year I did a show almost, like, every weekend. So, I'm like, Halloween market, people are actually going to buy the stuff, especially with, like, jewelry and stuff. Like, I've noticed that Comic Cons, like, sometimes the jewelry gets a little harder to sell because there's people are looking for, like, superhero prints. And they're like, mm -hmm. well, I didn't come here to get a skull necklace. I want Superman and I want my anime and I'm like... That's yep. fair. Yep. Or, you know, you go to the Halloween and the horror markets and people are just like, I want this because every day is Halloween. Um, and same with the reading, too. Because I mean, you always get those bunch of people who are like, I only read horror in October and in the fall. And it's like, OK, it's weird, but you do you. Come buy this book now. One of the um, things like people who say, I only sorry. like these monsters when they work this way and that way. <laughs> people are picky and you, yeah, yeah. you can't please everyone like. Or it's, it's like what JP said, like, they come to the booth, I sell them my soul. And I'm like, this is the story. They pick it up. They open a random page. I'm like, what was the page? What was on there that made you not want to buy this book? <laughs> I promise it gets better. And you read page 70 out of context. How could it be good? Now, a couple of questions. And this is just, this is aimed at all of you. Um, one of the problems I think that authors face nowadays, it always used to be the rule of thumb that you would have a target audience that you were writing your books for and they would be the people that you would aim it towards in terms of style and depth and everything else that goes into it. I think one of the problems that we have now is, unlike when that first started, is the genres are so blended. There's not, although we could say there's a science fiction genre there's a fantasy genre or whatever there are elements from those that are blended within other things and it's trying to find that niche audience that is going to be interested in the niche area that you've chosen and I think that can be really difficult and I think that's partly why synopses become really important because um within the synopses you're able to kind of sell that part of it but I think the person who I think who reads it is reads it very similarly to a university application personal statement. And what the admissions team do with that is they read the first sentence of the personal statement and they make a decision that then sends that thought process on to whether they will or won't be reading any further to accept them. Now, I know that they would read all of it, 
Um, but it, it's a bit like when you read the first line of, of a book, it gives you that idea of what's going to be going on in the book. And you either read that first line and you go, yep, this is the book for me. Or you read it and you go, mm, no, thank you. And I think that's the, the same issue that we have with the synopsis. So I think that very first sentence is a really key aspect of it. Um, but it's getting it right. So do you have any tips on that? How, how, how would you help authors get that sentence, uh, you know, so that when the agent or the publisher reads it, they goes, yeah, I want that book. Rewrite that sentence more than any other sentence in your book. That's my first advice. I think that that is by far the most rewritten uh, of anything. Um, but I also think, as you mentioned, like it's important to give as much as you can in the first sentence, the first page, the first paragraph. And uh, I think it's also important. I've always thought it's important to set the expectations of tone. I, I tried to read all of your books. I did not manage, but I read a little bit of everybody's books. And one thing about uh, Adam's book in particular, I read, I was like, I am glad that there's like cannibalism in chapter one, because like, it tells me like, this is, this is what I'm in for and I'm in for it or I'm not in for it, but at least there's no like halfway through the book. Oh, okay. So this is this cannibalism here. Yeah. My book so has I, more content warning because of the first chapter. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think it's really important in that first chapter to set the tone. Like it's not going to get any scarier than this, or it's not going to get any darker than this or, or what, whatever. And the closer you can make that the first sentence versus the whole pr first chapter, the better. That's really interesting because yeah. I don't run my books like that. My books tend to start off on a much simpler, less scary scale. And then every chapter gets worse than the chapter prior to it. And so there is a build up and it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds. And so it kind of has this complete cascade at the very end where it all kind of comes together. Um, and so, yeah, it is. that's a really interesting way of doing it. Um, and yeah, cannibalism I, in the first chapter is always interesting. <laughs> I, I think every way is legitimate. For me, I just, I wanted, I wanted to put it right in the front. Yeah, so, so everybody knew going into the story, they could make that decision right away. I'm, I'm not ready to read this book and they can put it down. That's fine, I'm totally good with that. I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I, I think you're right. I think um, the style of how a book is written very much reflects the story and the author. And it's okay to, you know, write it in a particular way and have a different way to someone else. I think that's, you know, that's that's a good thing. Um, and I think also different genres lend themselves to different things as well. I, you know, I think, for example, in crime books, if you had no murder or no crime in the very first chapter or two, it would be a very boring crime book. <laughs> but that's my opinion. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's right. Genre expectations, you know, uh, there's like when when we're talking about blending of of genres, you're you really have to like when you're marketing the book, when you're making the cover, you have to pick which is your primary genre, which which category on Amazon you're going to like stick it into, to right? I mean, that's one of the hard things that is about that. I have difficulty marketing freelance familiars because it was a lark and it's blend of a lot of different thi mm -hmm. things. It's very difficult to mar market unless like I find a person in, in person um, that's into that. And it is very niche and it has found an audience, but it's very hard for that series to go beyond that versus this versus these, which I say, this is an urban fantasy. There's med medicine in here here and there's a lot of action and there's werewolves and you know this blew up on facebook when i first published it so um it's it's all about like even though there's a lot of different complications within this story which do go straight out a little bit from just straight urban fantasy see mm -hmm. um there's you have to sort of like present it to the reader as X. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to, to point out also it can change. I pitched my book as a mystery. My publisher picked it up as a horror and now they market it as urban fantasy. So they've changed it over time to find different audiences. And so it's not, you know, it's not set in stone when you first put it out there. The, the only place you can sell horror on the internet is Kickstarter. What do you mean by that? I don't understand. Um, on the, 
just uh, gen general. It's very difficult to market uh, horror on on Amazon in terms of general, but on Kickstarter, it's kind of flipped because co uh, people who kickstart stuff are all about Cthulhu, Cthulhu and all mm -hmm. that. That so uh, Kickstarter generally inverts what's popular because oh. that's an underserved net niche and so it does very well on kickstarter interesting i, I never have thought no I've never used kickstarter before no. that's interesting uh, i kickstarted um the freelance familiar box set and i went through a course and met a lot of our authors and horror is one of kickstarter's best genres huh okay interesting good to know that okay. that is great, great. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to jump back and mention uh, the back to the, the first sentence of the book thing we were talking about a minute ago. Um, I didn't write my first sentence of any of my books first. I had the story going and I sort of like let it percolate. And that first paragraph, like you were saying, JP, that first paragraph was probably edited more than anything. But I don't know that I actually wrote the first line until I'd written three chapters. You know, I, I had a ton of story going. I, I knew what I was doing. And then I went back and I was like, how do I, like you're talking about, how do I hook people? What do I put in this beginning to get people to to want to, yeah. And, and that's how it's been done all my books. And mm -hmm. and they have, the first sentence hasn't always been the, the key point, but yeah, that's, you don't have cool. to write it first. It doesn't have to be the very first thing you write. That's all I was going to say. Yeah. I say it's different well, for every book. <laughs> every yeah. every, yeah. <laughs> every book, just like uh, sometimes that first chapter sticks. Sometimes I've gone back and rewritten farther back in the sto story. Uh, sometimes that first chapter gets axed and it's we started <laughs> what was chapter two. You know, it depends sometimes what you need for that book. Yeah, I think that's a really valid point as well. What's really interesting is that I think we've all each found the way that works for us. And I think that's an important aspect to think about, isn't it? Because not everything is going to work for every person. And each author has to make their own path, so to speak. They have to carve their own journey. And, um, you know, it, a lot of it is by listening to what other people do and, and you know, taking on board tips and tricks that other authors have used, which is one of the reasons why we do this, um, you know, to sort of share that, ex that that world experience because we've all got our own experience with it. And, you know, some things have worked and some things haven't and then some things will work for one person and they won't work for someone else. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, do you have, before we go into some readings, I'm going to go to each of you now. When you think of a, one top tip that you, you can share with the world um, about writing synopses and making it like amazing. We have to each come up with a tip? Brutal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah why not? <laughs> I, I, would say have, I would say have oh, other what? people read it. Write it and then have other people read it. That would be my recommendation. That's you have them tip. give you your opinion. Give opinion on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good tip. JP? I guess I would say uh, it has to be short. So be there's no better way to practice killing your darlings than when you're writing a synopsis. So just be brutal. Brutal, yep. yes. Excellent tip. Thank you. <laughs> Daniel? Boil your, your uh, book down to one sentence. Ooh, well, that's hard. <laughs> yeah. That's what you start with. And then you can go like, Okay, my synopsis is needs to be there, but start with one sentence. Then a single sentence. Ow, that's brutal. Yep, yep, cool. That's good. Maria? Yeah, that is brutal. What yeah. do you think? Um, like you said, have other people read it. Have people who have read the book read it, and have people who have not read the book read it, and oh. see like if the people who read the book, if they read it, they're like, yeah, that makes sense. That that captures it. And the people who didn't read it, after mm -hmm. reading it, are they interested? Would they buy it? Yep. I think that's great advice too. Yeah. Very good tip. Yeah, some very excellent tips. I think my tip would probably um, be um, get that first sentence of your synopsis perfect. Um, get it as a hook like you would in your book. Um, and if you can get a hooked sentence in your in your synopsis, then the person who re it's falling on the desk for um, will be more likely to then continue reading it um, and less likely to just push it to one side into the bin pile. 
Um, so yeah, there you go. All right, let's move on to our live readings then. You don't have to read if you don't want to or feel uncomfortable, but we, we would love it. Oh, yeah, we always offer a, a, an opportunity for our guest authors to showcase some of their work um, of their choice. Um, so feel free to select whichever piece you like. Um, you can include any links um, in the private chat. And what I'll do is when you're reading, I will put it on the screen. If you choose not to, you can still include the links and I will still put it up on the screen and also put it in the live chat as well for everyone to see so they can access it later. Um, so um, who, who would like to go first? Just throwing it out there a little bit. I could go first. Like yeah. Hey. Yeah, go, Daniel, go for it. So all you need to do is just introduce the book that you're reading from and yourself, where you can get it from, and you can read as much as you like. So I'll put you on the big screen. We'll all remain quiet in the background. So if you need help or you get stuck, just kind of look scared and not wave at us or something, and we'll, we'll pop back on and help you. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I'm going to read you the, uh, the first... Some from the first chapter of Emergency Shift. Got to make sure my hand isn't on this. And you can get this from Amazon or on my, if you want a, a, cop, a signed copy, you can get it from DanielPotterAuthor.com. So let's see. Deary, there's nothing wrong with my heart. The old woman insisted, despite the fact it wasn't beating. I heard nothing through the stethoscope pressed to her against her chest. She breathed, but only right before she spoke. Days like this, like these, make made me one wonder if the rapture captured if the rapture my Aunt Betty always babbled about had come and gone without anybody noticing. You called complaining of chest pain. Mrs. Weatherby, you're saying you don't feel any pain now? I asked with a professional smile as I glanced at my partner, Cindy, who towered over me with the stretcher at the ready. She had her arms crossed as she waited. She shook her head a little, declining to state her opinion. I feel better than I have in years, Abby, Mrs. Weatherby said and flexed her gnarled hand. Even the joints stopped complaining. It's so nice. The man in the suit was very kind. I gave up trying to find a heartbeat. From her blue lips and the coolness of her skin, she gave every sign of being a corpse, and I smelled the evidence of a code brown. As a paramedic, I should be administering CPR while C Cindy ready the defilibrator to shock her back to life. But she watched me with alert eyes. A code Z was a post-mortem patient that continued to move, but the usual symptoms included trying to bite chunks out of paramedics. Man in the suit, ma'am? I asked. Oh, he came right before you two got here. Wanted me to come with him, but I turned him down. I have things to do today. Told him I'd be right along after I finished some business. She laughed as if that had been a clever joke and pulled her shirt closed. Mrs. Weatherby, why don't you, why don't we give you a ride to the hospital just to be safe? Let the doc check you out, I asked her, offering my hand. Her eyes narrowed with suspicion. No, Abby, I think it's best if I stay here. No need to get poked and prodded for nothing. Uh, your blood, blood pressure is very low. I'm sure the doctor, your doctor would appreciate it if you got yourself checked out, Mrs. Weatherby, I said with a bit more force. As your neighbor, I would really appreciate it. The smile came back, warm despite her deadness. You have nothing to fear from me, dearie. So sorry for troubling you. And she squinted, she looked at Cindy, looked Cindy up and down. I squinting at her name badge. Colin, you're refusing transport, ma'am? Cindy asked with a voice steeped in professional disapproval. Yes, indeed. I won't be needing your frequent, won't be one of your frequent flyers anymore. 
She responded with more firmness than I had ever heard from her. The fluttering anxiety that I heard at my door every time she'd gotten a new prescription was completely gone. Cindy looked at me. I looked at her. We had no procedure for a talking code Z. We're not cops. We don't take anyone any place they don't want to go unless they've got life-threatening damage. Uh, Cindy presented Mrs. Weatherby with a refused transport consent form. In less than a minute, we were wheeling a stre stretcher with our only with our with only our medical ba bag on it past my apartment door. Cindy stopped. While we're here, uh, could I use your bathroom? I winced. Er, can you hold it? I haven't had a chance to clean up. From the full moon, Cindy finished with a bit of a smirk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Much for reading. That was wonderful. Got I got I got to say the voices slayed me. Thank you for that granny voice. I loved that. That was my favorite. You're welcome. Correct. <laughs> I haven't actually read that one before for out loud. Excellent. That's always exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Jules, Jules, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Sorry. I, I was just saying, I love it when we have authors read from their work because they because it's your work. It it there's so much love and passion put into the read. Yep. And it really brings it to life in a way that no one else does. Um, and whilst it's great having an audio book re read by someone else, when you read it live on here, it's it yeah. can be quite nerve wracking. So some authors type, like get rabbit in headlights kind of moment. They're like, oh, can't read this properly. So it's amazing when someone is. They is are in audio. Um, they're, Cindy K narrates the, them and oh. she does a wonderful, awesome job. And I, I heartily recommend it. Men, you check this out on Audible. That's really good. Audible is awesome. Great. Thanks for letting yeah, us know that. Yeah. 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 One of my children's books just been um, completed actually by um, a, a reader. So, yeah, um, I'm in the process of just working through getting the other one done and then I can do both of them and release both Yay. of them at the same time. Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's quite well, exciting. Um, but, yeah. Cool. I, that was an amazing read. Um, and I love the bit you, you chose as well. You kind of just jumped straight in there, um, which is really that's, cool. That's chapter one. So if we're talking about first lines, I think that was a pretty good one, yeah. one to start the series with. Yeah. Very intriguing. Very intriguing. Uh, I think that's, that kind of like makes a hook, doesn't it? Where you're kind of going, oh, you know, what's this book about? Um, so, yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, JP or Maria, would you like to go next? <laughs> no pressure you're good okay great yeah hey, 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 man. good man all right, so you know the all right. just reintroduce yeah. yourself one more time tell us where we the name of the book where we can get it and uh and yep yeah, just go for a while and as long as it feels good okay uh, so I'm actually going to uh, read from The Legacy of Rose Valley, which is the sixth book in the series that is not out yet. It comes out probably next month, maybe October. Um, so no one has read this except for my beta readers and my editor and me. Uh, so I'm going to read from that. I'm going to show you this cover because I don't have the cover for Legacy of Rose Valley yet. And the reason is because you see this one's called The Beast of Rose Valley. The Legacy of Rose Valley is intended to kind of wrap up the whole six book series. So they go back to the same hometown. This guy, The Beast... Uh, is makes an appearance and he's going to make an appearance here. I'm pulling out of the middle of chapter nine. So you're just going to be dropped into the action. And uh, if you've read the series, you'll definitely know what's up. If you haven't, I think you'll be able to keep up. I hope so. So here we go. And so it came around the house from the other direction, loping across the ground at a speed so rapid, Miriam struggled to process it. A beast like before, a man whose hair had grown untended, whose eyes had lost all humanity, not as tall as the original beast, but every bit as formidable. She lunged for the Garinger box just as the thing careened into her, knocking her back into Jake, who did little to catch her, instead stumbling to the ground. For her part, Miriam kept her footing enough to catch herself on one palm and get back to her feet. The gravel bit her skin, but she didn't feel the steam. She gave herself the space needed instead of the gun she wanted. Dub fired a wild round as they both retreated behind Miriam's car. It wouldn't be safe enough, and she knew she couldn't stay. She peeked around to see Jake scrambling to his feet in what felt like slow motion as this beast slammed its fists into the boxes, kicking them across the yard and scattering the contents. 
dub service pistol wouldn't be enough to keep this thing at bay, much less kill it. She had to get to the Garringer, wherever the beast had flung it to. Without any verbalization of her intent, Miriam bound from behind the car straight towards the beast, trying to get it as wide a berth as she could, counting on its fascination with the gear to keep her safe enough to pass. As she leaped over the cattle guard and registered the slowing of the beast's rampage, she knew her plan wouldn't work. She'd been spotted, identified, and classified as a threat. Rightfully so. She managed to dart out of the way of the wooden crate thrown her way. She saw the glint of the Garringer in the grass just as the beast launched another crate, losing its height enough to hit the ground next to her, splintering apart and jabbing into her calf the jagged end of a two-by-four. Miriam cried out and stumbled. Pain surged up her leg. Her momentum kept her up for a few more steps, but she couldn't keep her balance and started to fall for the ground. She reached for the Garringer. Maybe, just maybe, she'd be close enough to get the tips of her finger in the butt of the gun. She struck the ground and her fingers felt nothing but dirt and grass. She scrambled up to all fours, but immediately went down again as something grabbed her ankle. The beast held her with a loose enough grip that she could flip on her back and kick at his hand. He withdrew his, he, he withdrew his from her ankle long enough for her to scuttle backwards, but he came again, this time bending over and swinging his ape-like arms towards her chest. His fist connected hard against her ribcage, stealing her breath. She rolled. The beast pounded the ground once, but quickly corrected. Miriam tried to catch his wings, but the attempt only served to wrench her arms as the beast, by its own strength and momentum, pounded them against her real, own ribs. She steeled against the pain, realizing she wouldn't win a fistfight. She saw the glimmer of the gun just inches away now. She took another blow to the chest, but managed to free her arms enough to reach. She felt its cool against her skin, jerked it towards her, then fully gripped it. She swung it around, but the distance between her and the beast had grown so slight that she had no room to properly point the barrel towards him. She fired into the air. Nothing happened. Just a click. Of course, Gabe hadn't packed a loaded gun. He wasn't an idiot. He wasn't an idiot. Miriam used the gun as a crossbar and managed to hold the beast at bay for his next barrage, but she knew he'd try to take the gun soon enough and she wouldn't be able to win a tug-of-war against this creature any better than she could win a fistfight. Gunshots rang out from Dub's pistol, but if they were hitting their target, the beast made no indication that it mattered. Then the beast stopped and grabbed its own head, stumbling back up to its feet and stepping back. Miriam fought through the pain in her chest and gasped for breath and scooted backwards until she could find her feet. She bolted for the carport, Garringer in hand. Jake stood next to the sentry now, his eyes vacant and lost. He'd backed the beast away, but as he shook his head, Miriam heard the commotion behind her. She knew the effect had been temporary. Dub fired more rounds past her head. She didn't know whether he was a good shot or she just got lucky, but she managed to close the distance without a bullet. The beast didn't have the same luck, each pop causing blood to spatter outward, but none of the wounds slowed the thing down. Miriam searched the scattered boxes and found her quarry quickly, a box of large bullets. She scooped it up and dumped a few in her hand. Dub kept firing. She knew he couldn't have many rounds left. She loaded a round flipped off the safety and put the butt of the gun up against her shoulder. These things worked better on tripods, the weight almost proving too much to bear. Her shoulder would have to do, no matter how much the kick might hurt. The beast closed the distance, advancing quickly. She fired. Gonna stop there. Gonna have to read it to figure out if she lives or dies. It's the last <laughs> book, though, so she could die. She could yep. die. Oh, my yeah. God. Brutal. Yep. <laughs> That's the intens funny. intensity was off the scale, and I loved it. I'll be Thanks. <laughs> yeah. The fact you just plunge us straight into the the middle of what was going on, and it was almost like, oh god, hang on, wait, <laughs> what's happening? What's going I on? Think, I think a werewolf is coming after, and something. Yeah, yeah. That, that was. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, you were as scared as she feels in that moment from being <laughs> thrown in. You can certainly feel the tension that's going on and the sort of panic that's going on in her mind. Oh, yeah, it was really good. Um, I, I think it's, um, you know, action scenes we've talked about in here before, uh, but action scenes are quite difficult to write and some authors really struggle with them. Um, and it's a topic that, you know, I think we should do again at some point um, and sort of maybe look at a different aspect of, of action scenes. But they can be quite tricky to write, and I think you nailed it very well there. <laughs> Thank you. So well done. Thank you so much. And you had a couple of comments as well. I'll put one up on the screen. Um, he's Greg has also put this one. Hang on a second. I'm just catching up. Sorry, my computer's a bit slow today for some reason. Can't wait. That's a sneak peek. Yep. <laughs> um, and then we've also got, uh, hang on, where are we? Uh, okay. And also, Daniel, you've also got another potential <laughs> fan here. <laughs> <laughs> which is awesome um so there you go all right let me take that off the screen okay maria <laughs> i'm not good at reading out loud i'm gonna just throw it out there um oh. 
So uh, you guys pick. Do we want Ooh, yeah. the start of the first book or do we want the start of the newest book? Because Ooh. the publisher is not here to tell me no. <laughs> well, well, is this is this another exclusive? Maybe we want this. It's an exclusive. Book. I mean, Maybe usually if I'm at like a thing and people are like, "We're part of your book," I go with like the very beginning of book one because I'm like, I don't know. What to yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but since I'm sitting in front of my computer right yeah. now, yeah. Could I do an exclusive. That. Yeah. Or I could just. It's a raw. It. <laughs> I know that my wife is very excited for you to finally get your third book done. So you should read from that for her sake. Yeah, everyone's That's excited for that one to be done because it's been a very long gap. All right. Mm -hmm. Um. Here we go. Uh, I guess reintro. I am Maria Giacomatos, author of Infernal Symphony. We got the first two books available on Amazon and on my website, which is author Bloody Maria, um, and also on Blister Press's website. That's my publisher. Um, so you could read those books now. Uh, you can buy them. And I'll be happy. But right now, I guess we are doing an exclusive reading from the beginning of part three. So let's open it up and make it a little bigger because I'm a little blind, I can't see. Da, 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 da. Okay, here we go. Chapter one, a disembodied eyeball rolled from its late owner's bleeding socket, leaving a thin trail of blood along the concrete. Humming a merry tune, Emily Mavro picked it up and gave it a gentle squish between her thumb and index finger. She placed it at the top of the growing pile of eyeballs on the basement floor beside her left knee. To her right was a stack of freshly picked flowers. Four corpses slouched against the wall. There were gape mouths and hollowed eye sockets stuffed with flowers. Above them, a message was written in blood. Happy birthday! The red letters glistened as the flames from the candles danced, forming a semicircle around the bodies. Sucking in an anticipatory gasp, Emily placed the last couple flowers in the remaining empty eye socket. She clasped her hands and grinned, admiring her work. Zalem, I am ready. Daylight flooded into the dark basement as the door above the stairs behind her opened. She smoothed her black lacy dress and rose to greet her brother. As he approached her, the door swung shut behind him, the light shrinking to a mere sliver above the top. The sleeves of his black button-down shirt were rolled to his elbows, his hands tucked in his trouser pants. Despite the gruesome scene before him, his broad shoulders and pale face remained relaxed, unfazed by the stench of corpses and stale blood. Once he made it to the bottom step, Emily picked up the stack of flowers and held them out to Zalem. Happy birthday! When his gaze fell upon the flowers, Zalem frowned. Those were mother's favorite flowers. She told you not to pick them. Emily scowled. Well, perhaps she should be home more often to monitor me. They will die before she comes home anyway. Her shoulders drooped with her expression. You do not like my art? She sighed, tossing the flowers on the lap of one of the corpses. I was working on this all morning for you. At the sight of Emily's pout, Zalem softened. He clasped her hands in his, squeezing her dainty fingers. Of course I like it, he said. I love it. Emily peeked up at him and blushed. Do you mean that? He cocked his head, his thick black hair shifting away from his stunning green eyes. Would I lie to you? Emily trembled with excitement. I love you, Zalem. With a delighted squeal, she gestured towards the round wooden table in the center of the room. A single candle was placed between two teapots and matching teacups. Four chairs were placed around the table, though two were already occupied by fluffy teddy bears. Come, let us celebrate your birthday over our favorite teas. Returning to her happy humming, she skipped to the table and poured herself a cup of tea from one teapot and used the other to pour her brothers a thicker red liquid. But Zalem remained by the corpses. He stuffed his hands in his pants pockets and sighed. You are always so creative, Emily. It's a shame you've given up on your art. Emily froze. The table and the tea set vanished in a cloud of black smoke. She stared down at her palms. They were covered in blood. I know you miss this, Zalem went on. This peaceful life you've been seeking with your new friends, it isn't you. She spun around to face Zalem and gasped to find his face mere inches from hers. The smoke rose to the, her waist, enveloping, I think that's how you say that word, them in darkness. Seizing her wrist, he grinned, baring his sharp fangs. He raised her arm to eye level, blood dripping from her dozens of slits around her forearm. 
No matter what you say, no matter where you go, Zalem whispered, blood trickling from the corners of his lips, this darkness will never leave you. So let me ask you one more time, would you like to return with me? Emily yanked free from his grasp and grit her teeth. The darkness may never leave me, but I can leave you, she spat. I will never follow you back into it. Zalem sighed. Well, so be it. I won't pursue you any longer, but just in case. He reached into oh, his scroll too far. He reached into his pocket and withdrew a switchblade. Flipping it open, he used his free hand to grab her shoulder and spin her to have her back facing him. She clenched her jaw when the cold metal blade stroked the back of her neck. She could feel her dress loosening, hear the knife splitting its threads, but her body froze. She couldn't even turn her head to face her brother and was instead forced to stare ahead at the girl in front of her. An angel, whose blacked out eyes oozed black goo. The same black goo pouring from her mouth, staining her white dress, the knife carved into her flesh. Emily screamed. And we'll stop right there. That was excellent. And <laughs> what a first line. I mean, come on now. <laughs> I was acted out really well. <laughs> I was very enthusiastic. <laughs> when you when you kind of read in it, you 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 really see yourself in the character's mind and what the characters were thinking. And if I, actually all three of you, when you read in today, you kind of um, you read it in such a way that it presents the characters thoughts and feelings and what's going on in their head at the time and you can really visualize what's going on um so yeah really good <laughs> amazing yeah Thank i kind of like what we were saying um my first two books don't start off as intense i mean they start off like setting the mood it's a little like yeah spooky um but i'm like all right book three we know what we're up for but i was just wanted to set the grounds that we're yeah. we're, yeah. we're st taking it up a notch this time so <laughs> Just, just so you know, um, I love it. I, I love the fact we've had exclusives as well, which is really cool. We, we love spoilers here. We love um, authors sharing work that's not been published yet and all that kind of thing. So, um, you know, because it's all about sharing, isn't it, with the world? <laughs> if we don't help you and you don't help you and authors don't help themselves do that, then no one else will, which is sad, but true. Um, I, see, I see I got some comments. Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let's have a look. Another exclusive. Yes, we are off to a killer start. Ha <laughs> ha, gooey. I like the word gooey. Skull. What species of bird? Is oh, I'll slow it down. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I'll stick them on the screen and then people know what you're reading. <laughs> uh, so, Harmony oh, asks, what species of bird is that? Um, it is a Rallicus oh. balicus, otherwise known as a pineapple green cheek conure. Um, his name is Rally McBally. Um, Valley. Oh, yes, he so does wear a Victorian collar. Is that he was shredding some of his feathers because hormone season just hit really hard. Um, um, and his feathers are growing back good, everything's all right now, um, for the most part. But also, I just think the collar's really cute, so cute. It's very so, cute, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a Victorian collar. That's very cool. Um, and then we've got now Greg's Greg's done it during your reading, but I, I would actually add this comment to all of yours. Uh, you know, so all three of you, I think that your your reading has amazing imagery in it. Um and you know, it's 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 been really lovely hearing. Um ignore my dog. Somebody's chatting. <laughs> He's the dog in. I got the bird. Yeah. I have no very idea. Very quiet right now, but <laughs> He just he he hears like the slightest noise and he's just like we're under attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he likes to make his presence known very regularly. Um, all right, um, Adam, did you want to do some reading for us? I'd love to do some reading, of course. Yeah, that'd yeah. be fun. All right, let's yeah, see you on the big yeah. So um, there we go. I'm gonna read from my first book, The Mantis Variant. There it is. There it is. Mantis variant. So book one, uh, again, we have, they're called shifts. The, they've shifted up the evolutionary ladder and uh, they've been born with the superpowers essentially, but they can be murdered and their powers can be taken from them. So we're going to pick up with not only are there a small percentage of humans born with superpowers, a small percentage of them are born with physical changes to their bodies. And so 
we're going to go right there. Let me get to page 111. Nice and easy to remember. I'm going to pick up in the middle here. Agril's our main character. She's the one who escaped the cult. Uh, and she's observing things. Agril peeked around the door's frame. Three unique people were toiling together, and she tried to understand them in terms that made sense to her. One of them appeared to be a skinny woman covered in feathers. She seemed to be naked, and of all her exposed skin was accented with these little strange curls that fluttered as she moved. There was a second woman, and the only word Agril needed to use that encompassed her was giant. She was abnormally huge, towering over the bird woman with arms and legs the size of a normal person's waist. The giantess wore a patchwork outfit that was clearly made to accommodate her size. Their third companion was a bald man, wearing only a pair of underwear. His skin was an unnatural shade of green, not sickly, but almost plant-like. However, his primary peculiarity was that tiny crackles of electricity appeared to be sparking across his entire epidermis. The shocks traveled over the man's green skin, running up and down his limbs and over his face and head and torso. The three of them were carrying large objects wrapped in sheets, and Agro was disturbed by the looks of the things. One by one, the rigid forms under the pale shrouds were dropped into a stone well at the center of the room. Smoke was issuing from the mouth and coiled up towards the chimney ceiling. In chim chimney in the ceiling. Despite being deep underground, any fumes were siphoned away and the room was not hazy. What's the count up to? Growled the giantess. Who knows at this point? Replied the green electric man. Let's get to the next group. They dropped the last of the wrapped objects into the well and began to approach the door where Agril was hiding. She turned in surprise and jumped. To her further surprise, her jump launched her all the way up to where the stairs were blocked. She soared high, landed against the fallen rubble, and she clung to the rocks above like a bat. The giantess ducked through the doorway and entered the hall, followed by the other two. But to Agril's relief, they turned their backs to her and were headed down the corridor in the opposite direction of the stairs. When they were gone, she let go of the wall and fell hard, but she landed upright and on her feet. She raced back down the steps, entered the room, and approached the well. Over its edge, she saw the churning orange glow of liquid magma. Whatever was dropped down the well was now gone. The rest of the room was empty. She returned to the hall and proceeded to the next room. It opened to yet another set of stairs that led further underground. Another 17, growled a voice, and it came from below. Agril turned and sprint, sprinted back up the stairs and hid in the darkness. The three figures returned, and the giantess's arms were loaded with more sheet-wrapped objects. As they re-entered the room with the well, Agro crept back down to the doorway. We've lost so many, the bird woman said in a voice filled with sorrow. Who else did you, he who else did you hear about? She asked the electric man. The giantess grunted and lowered her burden to the floor. They continued to drop the things down in the fiery depths. Both of the stone brothers died, the man replied. Three of the werefolk are dead. There's an entire group in the nether swamp missing. And let's not forget that Ground Zero was in the lab, so the angel and demon plus anyone in purgatory are just gone. Just fucking gone. I overheard someone saying that the astral cave collapsed, the giantess added in despair. The submerged tunnel no longer exists, the green man con continued. There was a crack in the hydron, hydron chamber, and no one has been able to reach. Agro was silent, but the bird woman suddenly spoke over her companions. There's someone else down here, she said, and the three looked towards the door. And I'll stop there. Whee! Thanks for listening. Yeah, just kooky characters. Very good. <laughs> Very nice. Very good. I like the drama and the, the everything that's going on there. Hang on. Excuse me. Sorry. Oh, yeah, the world built. Yeah, uh, the chance to throw in little tidbits about other things that aren't related to the moment that's happening. Yeah, I, I think that's a fun thing to do. <laughs> this will be a present. So I... in, in my current work, work in progress, I'm doing um, usually I have like one or two chapters from like the antagonists. But in this one, um, the the main thing there, she's against people like the news and so everything happen happens in the book and then um i'll have a a news broadcast that sort of recasts everything they've done but in a 
horrible light. <laughs> so that's been really fun. Interesting. Fun. Like like you're you're presenting actual news reports in your book? Right. Well, oh. um it's I'm still like trying to figure out like right now it's it's literally just like a transcript of a newscast and mm -hmm. right and I'm trying to decide whether I want to like put more like uh descriptions and dialogue and uh, descriptions of the news anchors around in around that dialogue or just have the dialogue stand free, mm -hmm. free. and so um that's 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 going to be a question for my alpha slash beta re years but it's been a lot of fun to just sort of have this very antagonist newscaster who's the supernatural beat of portland Lynn just totally like slap everything that uh, our hero Abby Abby tries to do. <laughs> I think it's pretty interesting. I, I, yep, I think it's awesome the the things that we use and, and put into our work and and other things that have inspired us from the world that we that we use. I think that's great. Yep. Yeah, um, and I I think also adding things that are you know different to traditional just mm -hmm. loads of paragraphs where you're kind of adding in um, maybe an image or, um, you know, a recipe or, or whatever it is you're kind of including in the story. It just adds another layer to it, I think. And it's, it's, it's interesting. I think it's quite, now's quite a nice time to actually talk a little bit about our collaboration, Adam. What do you think? Oh, you want to do that? Yeah, totally. Well, we, I, we I, could, was, uh, I was thinking, we, I thinking we, we're going to read something. You don't want to read something? Mm -hmm. Oh, I could read something if you want me to. Uh, I think, I think we that's can... where we should go. Yeah, I think that's where we should go with it. <laughs> oh, you, what with the reading, or do you want me to yeah. talk, talk a little about our, our collaboration? No, no, no. I think I think I think you should read a little. Yeah. Why don't you read? Okay, I can read. That's fine. Um, okay. Uh, all right. I'll just drop a, a hint, like I try and do every week. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're doing is we're kind of incorporating. Um, a very different way, a different style of writing a psychological thriller, which is not just paragraphs and that the information. It's going to be laid out in a, a, an interesting and different way, which I haven't seen done yet for this particular genre. So um, it sh it should be quite interesting. It is it's progressing steady. So there you go. That's my little my little uh, breadcrumbs cool. there for you. <laughs> Nope, nope. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'll stick myself on the on the big screen for you. So I'm not going to show you the front cover on here um, that I've got in front of me, but I can actually show you uh, the front cover um, from here. Hang on, where is it? So the book I'm going to be reading a bit from is this one, um, Shadows, Shadow and Swords. This is book two of my dark fantasy series. Um, the, the book cover I've got on the one at the moment is my old one, so I'm not gonna show that with you at the moment. Um, okay, so um, I think I might start, yeah, midway through some action as well, actually. <clears throat> uh, why do you not leave me? I would have left you. Kez muttered through shaky breaths. Why? Because I'm not you, Kez. I've, I'd never leave someone behind. I helped her step over a fallen log. Ah, a true hero then. Her voice cracked and she let out a slight mocking laugh. No, I'm no hero, nor do I want to be one. I panted as the exertion hurt my legs and lungs. I just know what it's like to be left alone. She said nothing for another 15 yards and I wondered what was going through her mind. An older and wiser soldier whose wrinkles formed around her eyes when she talked gave away the number of winters she had endured. The bank increased in steepness and we skied, um, and we skied down the last 10 yards. Sorry, skidded. Oh, my brain's thinking of other words. And we skidded down the last 10 yards, causing her to cry in pain. We landed with a hard bump at the bottom and lay there, both winded, staring up at the bleak sky, threatening in a heavy snowfall. Here, I offered my arm as I rolled to one knee and without hesitation, she grasped it, enabling me to haul us both to our feet. 
Nearby were some broken twigs. Someone had recently travelled in the direction we were going. After ensuring Kez was steady, I checked the area as the urine smell permeated the air. It smelt human, though I had to make sure, so I scouted the ground to find the wet spot, and sure enough, further into the shrubs was a small patch of dampened soil, a head about a foot of two footprints. We were headed in the right direction. How much further? Sweat stung my eyes, so I wiped it away with the back of my sleeve. Getting tired, princess? Her smirk merged into a grimace and a moan. Why do you keep calling me that? I'm not. I tried to suppress the irritation in my voice. You're the chosen one, aren't you? Only princesses are the chosen ones. A wry laugh escaped me before I could stop it. Oh, so that's what's been bugging you, because I'm a sentinel. You've got to be kidding. It's my job to find the chosen one. Sentinels are like, are like the guardians of whoever that is supposed to be. And apparently I'm not even a very good one at that. You mean you don't know who? Why the hell would I? No, I don't. If you think I want this, this, this job, I don't. I'd, have no, I'd rather have nothing to do with any of it. All I want is to get my family back. And that's the only reason I joined the circle. My voice increased in volume with each word I spat out. There is only one person I want to focus on. She's a prisoner in the fucking castle that we can't get to on this mission. And it seems like I've been pulled in every direction away from her because life just isn't that simple. And you, I jabbed my finger at her. You have no idea what I've been through to get here to this very moment. And there I was thinking how brave you were and the rest of the commanders are and how wise you are. Yet you've done nothing but scorn me since we've met. I clenched my jaw, glaring at her. With a slight nod of acceptance, Kez gazed down at the ground. Ray, I'm... Loud shouts wafted through the dense woodland in a different direction, taking us further away from home. Come on, I helped her to her feet again, wrapping my arm around her waist and to support her weight. I hope we're not too late. We're headed away from town, she wagged her finger in a diff direction to our left. You'll be faster without me. Well, if I leave you here, you'll die and I'm not leaving you. So stop saying that. I'm not losing anyone else today. You got that? From her laboured breathing, it was clear she was in a lot of pain and her weight was becoming heavier and heavier. My muscles are screaming at me to stop, but I pushed on with every step. Come on, you can make it. They're a couple of hundred yards away. I continued pressing forward through gritted teeth. Kez's foot was dragging now, and I was almost carrying her total body weight. Every inch of my body hurt, begging me to stop. What will you tell Glass? I asked with gritted teeth as Sione's eyes flitted in my vision. We failed. Uh, what else is there to say? She tripped and fell forward, pulling me down with her, and we landed on a thick pile of dead leaves together. Oh, I crawled to my knees. Here, I handed her a flask, of, a flask with a mix of water, some honey from home, lemon and elder juice. It would at least help her feel stronger. Kez guzzled, guzzled the liquid till she drank over half the bottle then wiped her mouth and passed it back to me. Her eyes were red and glazed, and her face was dirty from the fall. Leave me, she said, pushing me away from her. No, I swatted my, her hand away. Why those things attack? A frank, they're, they're called a frank. I don't know. We've not something they'd ever interact with as they live and hunt in the northern bay for fish. They swim? And I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> oh. Click the right button. There we go. <laughs> what was that last bit? What was the last? Some, what kind of creature are they? The what? The Afranks. They the are, yeah, they're like the size of grizzly bears, but with scale skin that is really tough and hard, like, like a tortoise shell almost, um, with spines all over their bodies. And they are really dangerous. And yeah. <laughs> you sound awesome. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. And that that's the formation, I think, of um her relationship with Kez. Kez is quite an important piece a uh, person in the stories. So um, but they hate each other to begin with, hmm. as you can probably hear. So um, yeah, so there you go. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> 
it's uh I'm, I'm sorry to get used to you now asking me about reading now so i'm having to get something ready just in case <laughs> so we've kind of come to the end of um our show but before we go i just wanted to kind of bring us nicely back to uh the synopses do you have anything that you feel is a definite no-no when it comes to writing synopses I think it definitely depends on what you're writing the synopsis for. If you're writing it for selling for the back of the book or your pitch, don't give too much away. That's that's probably the most important thing. Um, don't take away something that don't take away joy that the reader is going to feel when they read the book. If you're writing for the synopsis to pitch the book, then you don't get a choice and you just got to put it all in there. But otherwise. Yeah, and in, yeah. In, the, in the pitch synopsis, it feels like you almost have to put all those spoilers in and sort of ruin the story. But yeah, that, that is that's what they want. <laughs> that's what they want. They want to know what this, the spoilers yeah. are because they want to know if they're worth it don't or not. Start, yeah. mm. Don't, don't yeah. start with uh, in a world. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, like, we like tropes. We don't like cliches. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, tropes oh. serve a really useful purpose. Cliches just a, a bit boring. <laughs> um, I think you can use them in your books, but sparingly. Uh, but tropes are great because you can use them as a as a framework for a story, and then use it to and just completely twist it's everything. So fun in to it. twist, yeah. So fun to flip tropes on their yeah. heads. And yeah, absolutely. That people think they know what's happening and do something completely different with them. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Um, Maria, do you have any advice that, or things that you would say is a definite no-no? Kind of like what I said earlier, don't give away, like don't put too too many names or try to explain too much. Like you, you don't need to do your world building in your, and this goes for the back of the book synopsis. Like you don't need to be doing your world building or explaining things. It should just be the very basic, this is what you need to know. No. Good advice. Good advice. Um, all right. Well, I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to call it as a nice end here. You get a. It's going to be nice... so fun to hang out with you three in person next week. That's going to be yeah, so exciting. Yeah, looking forward yeah. to that. I'm really looking forward to this show. Show. Yeah, you're going to have to tell me all about it and come back on. You know, all, you know, all three of you um, and tell us all about it and so, right. share. I will not be here next week on the book slam. That's yeah. right. I'll be yeah, up here right. right with us. <laughs> <laughs> You're not broadcasting the pot, the the panel from from the, the event. Yeah. Do you know what? You're very welcome to join us if you'd like to do that. That'd be amazing. <laughs> <I'll have my laughs> <own>. <laughs> that would be amazing. But yeah, do come back and visit us and tell us all about it. Um, and, and also, Jules runs a Discord channel that's all for writers and readers, and uh, I'll send you the link to that. Uh, it's it's recently really blown up, and everybody's talking and chatting and having yeah. fun talking about writing and stuff yeah so i'll send you the links to that yeah, yeah cool. do because it's uh, the, the whole purpose of doing this and also the discord um it, it, you know and, and sort of working with authors and and readers alike is to really build that platform so that authors don't feel alone they don't feel like they're isolated which is an unfortunate byproduct of writing um and and actually feel like they've got a community of people who are not going to judge them for what they're writing who are not going to be you know bitchy and catty and it's just a nice community they're genuinely so lovely everyone on there um and so supportive and so excited for everyone's news which is amazing um i'm still in the process of trying to like set it up so it's like a link between youtube and that it's a bit tricky because i have to get indie to set it up but uh yeah <laughs> Indy's the producer for this, in case you wondered. Um, but yeah, it is once I've got that, then you'll have a bit more regular sort of link ins with this. And uh, I've got a few more ideas of what I'm going to put on there. So watch this space. Um, so I'm going to um, add the link that you've got, you've sent oh, me, yes. JP. Thank you so much for going. that. This is so, do you want to tell us a little bit about this? So, this is the link to, to actually see more about the event but did you want to just remind us where the event is and you know what it's going to be about sure so the it's a portland uh, convention center uh right near the water on the river um it's i think they've done this several years already i don't think this is the first time have you no, I think this is only the second time oh oh cool it's pretty new cons so i remember they had uh i think they like just started it last year mm. so i remember they were promoing it at the Haunters convention that they used to have in Portland. Oh, have you done? Yeah, it's a big part of it. 
What was that? Did you do it last year as well or yeah? I did not because I had already gone to Portland in May for the Haunter convention. So I was like, oh, I was just here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I think, I mean, it must have been decent if they're doing it a second time. Well, it's enormous this year also. Yeah. yeah, and it's in the convention center, which is, you know, pretty good size. It's not just a hotel. And it's two full rooms, one of vendors where we're all be. And then there's a whole separate room of, of interactive horror exhibitions and exhibits wow. and, and things. Yeah, that's going to be really neat to go through. Yeah, and giant yeah, haunted house. Like costume yeah. contests. I think some, some sort of like vampire sort of dance thing going on. There's all sorts of, yeah. That's cool. That's creepy, cool. creepy events, yeah, involved in it. They don't have anything like that over here, which is really sad. Really? Well, they, have stuff, they have stuff in London, but there's nothing where I live. Uh, okay. I, say, like, I feel like London would have something. How far, how far are you from but... London? You just have to come to Portland next year. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. Uh, it's it. a short jump. <laughs> Only <laughs> 18 hours. Oh, really? hours. 18 hours by by plane. <laughs> I'll row over to you in a little dinghy or something. Yeah. <laughs> No, I would love to be able to come over to Portland and go to some of the events there because I'd really like to start something up where I am, um, at, you know, because there's loads of indie authors in, in my area um, and I there just isn't anything to celebrate them and I think that there should be. <laughs> we love indie authors very much on here. So I am going to say a huge thank you to you all for coming tonight. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure um, having you on today. And I hope you've enjoyed today. And I hope you'll come back and visit us. And I hope you'll come back and tell us all about the event as well. Um, that'd be so cool to hear all about it. Um, and to maybe engage more readers to, you know, more, you know, to buy books or even people to, to start writing and sort of inspire them a little bit um you know so thank you to all of you so thank you jp thank you daniel thank you murray it's been an absolute pleasure yeah, thank you to, you're yeah, welcome thank you. you're welcome um uh, yeah we please join us on the discord as well um like i said it's a really lovely community um and yeah we we would love to see you again so thank you so much to you as well adam as always and i'm gonna bid you farewell and good night take care Bye.